Hey everybody, welcome. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Too Much CGI, the show where Bill, that's me, and Scott, that's you, Scott. How you doing? <laughs> we talk about pop culture, nostalgia, all the cool geekery that we love, we grew up on. If you're a 40-something, this is the show for you. You found your tribe. Stay with us. And I'll tell you what, if you're a 40-something, you're going to really relate to the way that I feel today. Oh. <laughs> what the hell's going on, man? What's happening? Dude, I'm telling you, I am getting to that age now where everything is starting to break down. Okay, so I'm 48. I've had some hard living, so maybe, but give me an extra five years. I'm 63. That's not math. <laughs> I'm 48. You know, I lived hard. Give me another like 10 years on top of that, right? I'm 58. So, round it up. Say I'm 60. So I took my employees out yesterday for a like a picnic day. You know, it's the end of summer sure. and it's allergy season. First of all, in Pennsylvania, the allergies right now are just nuts. I never hear you complain about allergies. I don't think you suffer. Uh, only when I cut the grass. But yeah, I never had any problem at all with allergies till I moved into this house. And now I have every tree imaginable in southeastern Pennsylvania in my yard. And I don't know which one's fucking me up. Maybe they're all teaming up and fucking me up, but when I cut the grass, done deal. When you get older, everybody teams up on you. Allergies team up on you. Aches and pains team up on you. You're just like miserable from head to toe. And now I see when I saw all the old people being grumpy and angry and just mean all the time. Now I get it. Now I get it. it sucks getting older. So I took the team out <laughs> and they're all like, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a potato sack race. Oh, shit. We're going to do a relay race. We're going to do this thing where you put your head on the bat and spin around three times. We're going to kick soccer balls. And, you know, the, I'm the oldest one there. At 48, I'm the oldest one there. The next one is like 45, and then we got a 43, and then it goes down to 30s and 20s. And uh, when I tell you, this is the first time that I felt like half a man in front of people. I was just not able to pull anything off. I fell down. I can't even move today. I had to take like a, a salt bath this morning before I went to work. Like I'm some <laughs> kind of warrior, like I'm some kind of athlete who just had a, you know, an amazing game. All I did was a relay race and I can't move today. I, I can't handle anything because of the allergies. And here's another thing. I went out with them for drinks. Oops. And I know, I, <laughs> I know I got to live it. So I drank one drink. No problem. I feel fine. I drank another drink. It's been two, three hours. Drank a third drink. I'm like, that was too much. Should not have done that. Went way over the limit with that one. So now I had to wait that one out. And I feel that this morning. Do you re I know we talked about this on the show. Like, man, the way we used to drink. I never thought three drinks could take this bear down. <laughs> but I felt it all day today. And it wasn't like a hangover. I couldn't do my work. It was more like a, you know, you've been drinking last night. So allergies. Sore as can be. Like I just picked up a, a bus yesterday and I'm feeling that way today. Alcohol, it's just brutal. I can't hang with young people anymore. I am officially retiring, as of this statement, any association with young people outside of the office. I just can't do it. We're just too different. You should have had your liquid IV. Would it help with the booze? It would have helped with the uh, sack race? Yeah. Yeah, everything. Everything. But it was just a bad cause. Like, oh, I'm not going to need it. It's not like I'm going to get hung over on three cocktails it was one of these cocktail <laughs> bars that opened up near philly it was just incredible every drink was either it was on fire or was spitting up bubbles or it was smoking it, that's a whole new thing i'm not familiar with all these cocktail bars popping up hey everybody just want to remind you if you want to get in touch with us you can go to too much cgi.com or you can go to too much cgi on twitter or facebook we post there i like to post news items up there on twitter some things that you know we might read here but Maybe we don't read here, but it's that kind of stuff. If you like our show, you'll like our Twitter. Uh, I might be a little slow on it, Scott. I might be a little slow the next few days. I'm going to Dallas tomorrow morning with a hangover, allergies, and a sore body. <laughs> Let's add some jet lag to that, too, huh? Oh, jeez. I get food poisoning in the uh, in the airport. Well, you, you get imagine? food poisoning, COVID, and jet lag, and you'll just have the whole fucking trifecta. Oh, yeah. COVID's back around. Yeah. The vid is here again. Oh, Wait till you hear me coming back. I'm going to have so much complaining that you're going to have to listen to. It's just, I feel for you. <laughs> Too much CGI.com. We want to see you. 
Yeah, head out to the website, send us an email, tell Bill to stop bitching and suck it up. Here's more reasons that I know I'm getting old. I have no idea, not a single clue, what's going on on TikTok. How much do you know about TikTok? I know the exact amount of information about TikTok that a 43-year-old should know, which is not much at all, and I'd like to keep it that way. It's amazing to me how much it's grown. I mean, the younger people in my crew, especially getting to hang out with them more than I usually do this week, and just what they're telling me that they're doing on TikTok, I'm like, I had no idea it had any purpose other than like weird edited videos. Yeah, it started off as dancing and people doing like dancing that they saw on there and and emulating dancing and then filming themselves doing the dance and then reposting that and it became a whole fucking thing. And there was something with sea chanties, like maybe last summer or something. And then it just got weird from, I'd say it got weird from there, but let's face it, it already started off pretty fucking weird. So yeah, that's what I know about TikTok. I almost offended one of my uh, younger staff because I'm walking around all day being a fucking baby, bitching, crying. You know, basically a migraine was coming on from this cocktail of hell. So she's like, hey, here's a pill that I take when I get my migraines. And I'm like, I've never heard of this. She even told me and I forgot the name already. But I'm like, I've never heard of this. Where'd you find out about this? She goes, TikTok. And I'm like, you think I'm going to take something that TikTok recommended to you? And she goes, oh, I don't know why you say that. She's like, there's doctors on TikTok. Like you, you write to them or you, you whatever. And they write big videos back to you. So I don't think I realized that TikTok became legitimate somewhere and that it's basically a YouTube competitor. Cause in my head, it's an Instagram competitor and young people are really using TikTok in this way. Like you and I use YouTube to learn how to do shit in our lives. Yeah. But I'm not going to YouTube to find a doctor or ask for medical advice. That's still fucking crazy to me. That is a little crazy. You're saying they're getting legitimate. I still think that that coworker of yours or that employee of yours is really overestimating the legitimacy of that person that's giving them advice on TikTok. That's fucking crazy. Oh, you think young people are making mistakes? What? (laughs) Yes. We were talking about this the other day in the office. I was like, you know, I take my AI discussions that we have here, I take it to work because AI at work helps me sure. as well. You know, so we were thinking like, you don't need to be a great mind to pass a test, right? If you're good at taking tests, you can pass a test no matter what the subject sure. is. There's plenty of lawyers, doctors, psychiatrists who are not good people, not good at their job, <laughs> do not have critical <laughs> thinking skills, but they were able to pass that test. So yeah. The information that they've learned, if you really think about this, where my head's been lately, the information that they learned, they learned from going to classes. They learned from books. They learned from lectures. They didn't have YouTube. They sat in a classroom. They learned the same stuff. Okay, stay with me because I'm not saying let's all go to uh, WebMD <laughs> and get our University. But what I'm saying <laughs> is the information that they got that the lawyers got in law school, that it's all out on the internet now. So if it's there, are we really that impressed when a doctor says something to us, like we couldn't get this information from fucking TikTok? It seems crazy, but it's maybe not. Maybe we're a little outdated and out of touch. Maybe. Oh, I don't deny that. I'm just not ready to go that route. I mean, that's where I'm at with it. Well, here's another thing that I was thinking too. Twitch, you and I aren't really that familiar with it, but young people love it. It started out as what you you said earlier was like a video game platform. Yeah, it's not. Well, not anymore. Like now people stream whatever. Like you can go there and watch somebody do uh, songs for you. You can go and watch people play uh, instruments. Uh, uh, I don't know even know what else is there. But one of my coworkers told me about a, <laughs> one of them synthwave bands that I like. She goes, <laughs> just go on Twitch. They're streaming at seven o'clock. What? So you go and the band's there giving you a private concert. And I didn't know, like, this is this is a way of interacting with music that there's never been a way like this before. And yeah, YouTube can do it, but it happens on Twitch. More things are happening on Twitch, and I feel like I'm missing a lot of it. Is a live event like this costing money to get in to see the stream, or is it just like there for the taking? From what I could tell for this band, it was there for the taking. And they just announced, yeah, we'll be here at seven. We'll do it again. Are these bands trying to make it that are trying to get out there and just get heard? Or are these like established bands? I mean, they're not Foo Fighters. 
but they're, <laughs> I, would they're bands. I would have heard about that bill. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, they're bands that, you know, they, they tour and they, you know, fill their little clubs, but yeah, they're not big bands. Okay. But could you imagine like getting that kind of access to your favorite bands growing up? No, I couldn't. I was happy when they came around with the unplugged series on MTV. No wonder MTV is not a thing anymore. There's better things for kids. And I feel like I'm one of these parents now we're going, huh? Well, I'm out of touch. I didn't even know. Back, Back in my day, day, we didn't, day, have, this. I didn't have that. But I'm really, you know, my son's grown and out of the house, so I don't know a lot of the things that are, you know, in in your kids' world. Like now, I'm out of touch. I finally feel out of touch. I finally feel old. I feel worn out. I've look, you know, I've had some hard living. So my joke earlier, I'm 48, feeling like I'm 100. Yeah, I do, and that feels really weird. And this has been like the week where I'm going, holy shit, everything has converged. I am really over the hill now. Man, that sack race really fucking did you in, man. <laughs> I fell down. Oh, when I, when I did the bat thing, I got dizzy. I almost puked. I almost puked. I almost passed out at one point, dude. It was so bad. It was awful. But you realize where you fucked up here, right? Trying to keep up with a bunch of young fit people. No. Thinking I'm still no. a competitor. No. See, you're thinking too far. You got to go back further. You hosted a picnic. You should have planned the events of the picnic because when you would have had planned events, you weren't going to pick all this horse right. shit. You're not doing dizzy bat spin. You're not doing right. sack races or three-legged races or wheelbarrow bullshit or any of that. You would have had a full schedule planned out with old man shit. You know, the, the young people would have thought you were an asshole, but you would be feeling a lot better about yourself. I mean, the saddest moment of this relay was we had to put on like oversized pants and shirt and run holding it up. You know, while we had to do some stuff like that, it was just the worst episode of Double Dare ever. So I finally get back to my person and I'm laying on the ground like a baby trying to pull these oversized pants off. And Jess, who's getting them, she's yelling at me. She's yelling. I own the company and she's yelling at me. Come on, Bill, what's wrong with you? I'm like, this is the most shameful thing. I'm on my back like a baby trying to get pants off. Now, here's the real question. Is there video of this? And when's yes. it going up on too much no. CGI? No, uh, no, 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 no. You want you want followers and you want listeners. I, I think this is bad. the kind of self depreciative shit you got to do. No, no, nope. I ain't doing it. It'll end up on that Twitch, and I don't even understand Twitch. And it's like <laughs> I'll be a freaking sensation for the wrong reasons. You want to go viral? This is the fucking way, man. More about that Twitch. So I was watching YouTube videos where people were calling in to prank the. Uh, uh, what are those C cable access shows, you know, <laughs> yeah. like Wade's world, you know how like Stern used to always call in. Well, there's people <laughs> on YouTube that were doing this, uh, I guess back in the day and uploaded their content. And as I'm watching these public access shows get pranked, I'm realizing that the little that I do know about Twitch, it's Twitch. People tune in just to watch some guy who really doesn't have anything to say, say something. And people are tuned in. They're not bored. They're so interested in what <laughs> millions of kids think. Kids being anybody under 30 on TikTok and all on Twitch and all these things where people just watch people talk. And I'm like, in in our day, oh no, it just oh, came out. Oh man. It just happened. In our day, you had to be funny to be watched. Now you just have to be alive. Here we are trying to be funny, and they're definitely getting more views than we are. Yeah. What the fuck are we doing wrong? Joke's on us, I suppose. Yeah, I think we're, <laughs> we're all just outdated fucking milk now. <laughs> are we trying too hard here? <laughs> yeah, we might be. Oh, uh, well. Oh, well, we love our fans. We love you. Hopefully you love us, and we keep, keep ourselves in our little bubble and safe from young people. Scary young teenagers. <laughs> Get them off our lawn. What do you want to talk about today, Scott? Um, I've been doing some watching here. I actually got sick this past week, not the vid, but it gave me some downtime to actually go and catch up on some television. I'm still watching Ahsoka on Disney Plus. Are you watching Ahsoka? Yeah, the new one that came out last night is going to be what I watch on the plane tomorrow morning. Okay. So it, it picked up a little bit last night. This is going a little bit slow for me. It's not a great series. It's not a bad series. I'm still watching it, but... This is on my, my weekly watch list. I'm still watching Only Murders in the Building on Hulu. That's the one with uh, Steve Martin, Martin Short, Selena Gomez. Uh, they're in season three right now. Episode eight dropped last night, and I thought I only saw like three of them, but I've been watching them every week. Apparently, it's just been two months, and 
I just don't remember. <laughs> like, <laughs> do you remember the article? Did I send it to you or read it on the show last week about Martin Short? And somebody wrote and called him sweaty. They're like, ah, when are we? The article was like, when are we going to say we've had enough of Martin Short? And called him like unfunny, sweaty, and <laughs> something else. I'm like, <laughs> this hatchet piece went around on Martin Short and Stern talked about it. I saw it in my feed. Somebody called wow, him sweaty. No. The only thing you shared about was Selena Gomez uh, kind of going scab with a Instagram post that she took down yeah. because she talked about missing being on the set. But I don't know. I think Martin Short and Steve Martin, like their brand of comedy, they play well off of each other with like the insult comedy. And I think it's funny. I enjoy yeah, them. Me too. But I'm old. Yeah, we're old. We're old. <laughs> I was watching the Conan O'Brien podcast, which is a great show, yeah. by the way. I, you know, we have the rule that celebrities shouldn't be in podcasting. But maybe I'll give him a pass because he's actually really fucking good at it. <laughs> and he had he had Martin Short and, and Steve Martin on. And just when you see them two even being interviewed together, they're always performing and they're just in lockstep and they they're great. It's yeah. great watching them. So somebody to say that they think uh, Martin Short is old, washed up and sweaty. <laughs> it just made me <laughs> laugh. I don't know why. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can't watch the two of them and not think of Three Amigos. I mean, the only thing missing is Chevy Chase, but, you know, that takes me right back to that movie, and that was something I watched a lot of growing up, but, yeah. yeah me too. So you're watching the newest episode of Ahsoka while you're on the plane to Dallas. I don't think you ever got into it. What are you going to Dallas for? Oh, right. I'm super out of it, guys. I am sorry. So this is a movie premiere I'm going to. In Dallas. So I mentioned before, uh, I threw some movie into that or through that Indiegogo platform into a movie called Dr. Gift. Oh, and you talked about Dr. Gift. Yes. I remember so, that. How could who could forget that name? Well, tomorrow is the premiere in Dallas and my wife and I are going to fly in and go attend it and see what it's all about. It's been a neat experience because the whole reason I did it was to try to see this side of producing and see this side of investing what I didn't realize was Indiegogo is a little bit more of a, hey, here's just some money we're just chipping in, not as much as yeah. of an investing platform as I thought it was. So I didn't have any real control over this, and you know, I kind of would want some as a creative person. But Abel was very cool. His name was Abel Berry. Um, he sent me, you know, a view of the movie, and I was like, I gave notes, and I was like, wow, this is great. I'm giving notes, you know. So I'm gonna go tomorrow and see if he took some of the notes. He may not have. Maybe the exact same movie I saw, but I saw it, you know, many months ago. So it'll be really interesting. You're not going into this completely blind. Like you have some idea what the finished product might be. Yeah. I mean, if he changes nothing, I have seen the entire finished product. Wow. Do you get to walk a red carpet? I don't think it's this big of a thing. I mean, it's a movie. <laughs> it's a he, it's a theater. Our our friend Paul, my friend down in from Dallas. Oh yeah, uh, we'll have him on yeah. someday. He told me he's like, oh yeah, it's a great place. I go all the time, so I have a sense that it's more of like a music theater. It's not yes. just a movie. Well, I'm not just going to an AMC. We're not that small budget, but <laughs> this it's a small budget Indiegogo project, and it is definitely a B horror movie, and it's made to be a B horror movie. It's got people from B horror movies, and the main star is uh, Danielle Harris, and Danielle Harris was in. Halloween 4, she was the little girl that ran around. I don't know if you remember that series. You mentioned you had somebody from another established horror franchise being the star of this. So yeah. that's pretty cool. It, like somebody, you know, who's at a con who would actually attract some autographs, you know. She went on and replayed a, another character in Rob Zombie's Halloween. So it was neat. You see the little girl uh, actress again. And then she's just been doing, you know, B-horror movies and things like that on the way up. And <laughs> I don't think it's the way up, but it's the way lateral, maybe down a little bit. It's not Halloween quality, <laughs> this thing, but it is, there's humor in it. It's silly. It's funny. It's the kind of stuff that you and I laugh our asses off on. And uh, I'm happy to have tried it, hope to do more, and we're going to see what happens tomorrow. And this is low budget enough that you're not a scab. Yeah, none of us are in the union, as far okay. as I know. There you I know go. I didn't that's sign all the union papers. That's all that matters. There you go. Awesome, man. Well, I look forward to having some uh, some stories about your Dallas trip. I can only imagine they'll be half as good as your stories from Mexico. It better not be like Mexico, because I came back with completely different stories than the ones I wanted to tell you. Those are nightmares. I want to have good stories, too, coming back from this trip. Don't psych me out. And I'm telling you, man, <laughs> this is the first time I've been on a plane since Mexico. I have thought about Mexico about 10 times today. So as I was complaining earlier, my head is in a mess 
I'm also anxious about this flight just because I'm afraid of this whole thing turning into Mexico again. Well, if nothing else, go there and eat some good food because Dallas is a barbecue mecca. So. Yeah, we're staying in Deep Ellum. It's an artsy place. It's got so much great barbecue. I wish I could bring some home for you. I know that's your uh, passion, but I don't know that I'm allowed to. I'm jealous. Am I allowed to bring food? You can't. Isn't it like you can't bring seeds from state to state? Like I've heard so many weird laws about what you can and can't take. You can't travel with produce internationally, but I think within the country you can. Not really. You can buy it. You you can buy a banana at the newsstand and take it on the plane with you if you're going to eat it. I swear to God, this was a conversation <laughs> I had at work, and one of the people because people flew in. We were talking a lot about travel, and she said, "Yeah, I'm not allowed to bring seeds from uh, Florida to for you to plant here." I'm like, what? <laughs> I didn't know that. I mean, were they marijuana seeds? What are we talking about here? There might be other reasons you can't travel with seeds. And it could have just been TikTok information that... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> here we go. This is how misinformation gets out there, man. The Chinese run TikTok. Don't forget that. <laughs> oh, no, no. That conspiracy theory is just going to get crazier and crazier. Oh. And I don't even know how much of that is going to be a conspiracy theory. Yeah. They are getting a lot of data from us. Well, be taking horse dewormer and all kinds of shit to solve problems. It's not in, injecting bleach. Hey, stay the fuck off of TikTok. Go see a real doctor. That's my advice to you. Yeah, parents understand what's happening. Is it that your kids are giving all their data to the, this Chinese company who's going to give it to advertisers and people that can sway their minds? And that may or may not be a concern to you, but to many parents, it is. Listen, some other things that TikTok has done is brought us eating Tide Pods. And <laughs> planking and all kinds of stupid shit that makes no fucking sense and is not good for anyone. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But the other thing I've been watching, FX's series, What We Do in the Shadows. Yeah, you like that one. I had a couple false starts with this one. This series has been going on since about 2019. And uh, I've been, I started watching it. I must have watched the first episode like six times. And I would always fall asleep and then it would be like, you know, Hulu has me up to like episode eight. And I'm like, I don't remember any of this. So then like I have to go back and rewatch what I already kind of watched. Yeah. You try and find where you fell asleep and you never find it. It's so many false starts with this show. With the Harley Quinn show, I just realized yesterday that I, or two days ago that I've been watching it all wrong because of that exact reason. I let it go a couple <laughs> episodes. I tuned back in. It's a cartoon. So it doesn't, you know, the connectivity doesn't really matter that much. I didn't notice I missed five episodes that is a problem yeah. these interfaces aren't so great <laughs> i don't have a solution but i know i definitely fall victim to it but the show is actually a series based on the 2014 movie with taika waititi and uh jimaine clement who we both loved from flight of the concords so uh it's it's a show about vampires living in modern day and and they're, they're just a bunch of bumbling idiots and they play the part so good and the dialogue and the writing is so so fucking on point uh, i just love the whole thing about it and like now i've watched because i've been homesick i watched all the way up through i'm um, about halfway through season four they're currently airing season five so i'm almost completely caught up but uh, i've been watching this and it got me thinking it's a good time of year to be watching something like this uh heading up here into the haunt season and halloween and whatnot so so it got me thinking, how about we work our way up to Halloween by talking about some uh, creatures of the night, starting off with vampire. You said creatures of the night. My head went to ladies of the night. I was like, what? The? He just changed topics. And No, 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 no. He is referring to vampires. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. So the, the show you're talking about, sell this to me a bit. Here's my problem. We both kind of found it at the same time. We're both fans of Taika Waititi. We love yes. Flight of the Concords passionately. So we were a big fan of him and, and Jermaine Clement. And the movie was great. I loved the movie. They were all great in it. So when they went and made the show, Jermaine's producing it. Taika's producing it, I think, but not yes. in it. So uh, guest spots here and there. Okay. They both play guest spots. Like they're part of like the Worldwide Vampire Council. But and I'll talk about that a little bit. But it's just so tongue-in-cheek funny about uh, so to, to kind of talk about it so throughout history we're going to talk about here a little bit throughout history there have been different depictions of vampires sometimes they're more creature-like or more bat-like sometimes they're like very charismatic sophisticated humans that are very seductive and very um 
uh, again, the best way to say would be like uh, charismatic. But this show includes like every version of them. So they, they come across like all these like different vampires. Like they live in Staten Island. And there's a different vampire clans that live like in Manhattan and live here and live there. And like they all come across. Some are very bat like, some are very like vampires must take over the world. These three Yahoos. Um, <laughs> it's, so the three main characters are Nandor the Relentless, who is an ancient Iranian, pre Iran, but like a Middle Eastern uh, conqueror. Um, his buddy Laszlo Cravensworth, who is an English nobleman. And then his bride, Nadja, who uh, is actually the one that turned Laszlo into a vampire. And then, like, they have, like, all this ancient history. They've been around since the 1400s. They also live with a guy named Colin Robinson, who's a completely different kind of vampire. He's an energy vampire. So the way he feeds, he doesn't go around and drink blood like the others do. He actually just bores the shit out of people and then, like, sucks their energy. So he goes into places... Uh, he works in like an office building. Everybody says he looks like Dilbert. That's like a running joke throughout the entire show. He goes into these office buildings and creates these like completely awkward situations and just feeds off like the panicked anxiety ridden energy that these people give off. And it's just <laughs> comedy ensues. That's the best way I can I can phrase it. They also bring in some other vampire history. Uh, there's Van Helsing, who's a famous vampire hunter. Uh, one of their familiars uh, and a familiar is a human that does the bidding of the vampires generally in hopes of being turned into a vampire one day. But the familiar in this is Guillermo who he finds out through a 23 and me or like one of those <laughs> fucking <laughs> genealogy things that he actually is a descendant of Van Helsing. And he's like this really unassuming nerdy nebishy guy and he goes on these straight up unintentional vampire killing sprees. And it, it's just, he does it to protect Nandor and the rest of them. But it, it's just comedy gold. It's just so funny and so well written. It, it is good. And I hate it's one of those Seinfeld type things that we talked about last week for me. I, I would go to it, watch three, four episodes, go, this is the greatest show on TV. I'm going to take a break, come back, never. I don't know why it happens, but it is a good show. It just isn't sticking with me, and it should. It's a great show. Yeah, and like I said, that's kind of the exact reason why I had so many false starts with it. And honestly, I had to kind of limp through season three. It got into too much CGI territory. They started bringing in, like, I mentioned there's, like, different kinds of vampires. There's one that's, like, the father of all vampires, and he's like this gargoyle-looking thing, and the CGI is just so bad on it. And Colin Robinson, he, he he becomes a baby. There's this whole other story, and like they like kind of do that deep fake thing where they put his face on like a baby and then a twelve-year-old boy, and it's just like so poorly done. And I'm just like, oh, this hurts to watch. But everybody I know that watched it, that's a fan. They're like. Stay with it. There's a payoff. I understand it's shitty, but get through that, and there's a much better payoff at the end. So I'm still sticking with it. I was actually watching right before we hopped on here to do the show, and um, yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. Another character that showed up later on is uh, Kristen Schaal. Uh, you may know her from Bob's Burgers, and also she was in Flight of the Concords as well. Uh, she plays uh, another vampire, so yeah, it's, uh, it, it's kind of funny. And like I said, they really do pull from all these different vampire movies, vampire tropes, vampire shows throughout history. The one, Guillermo actually kills a baron who is like a, a leader of, of the vampires. Uh, he kills him by opening the door and, and, and killing him with sunlight. Well, uh, they have to go in front of the vampire council, and the vampire council is Danny Trejo playing his character from Dust Till Dawn. Paul Rubens playing his character from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. They have Wesley Snipes phoning in via video phone on a television playing Blade. And then Taika Waititi's there and Jemaine Clements are playing their roles that they played in the What We Do in the Shadows movie. So it was like a great throwback to all these movies and all these 80s and 90s characters throughout all these other vampire movies. And of course, they didn't call, they, they called Paul Rubens, they called him Paul. And they called Danny Trejo Danny. They didn't call him like their actual 
characters' names, but they it was clearly them. Yeah. Very clearly them. Huh. That's cool. So because of all this vampire history and everything that what we do in the shadows has brought to me, I'm thinking, like I said at the top of the show, we're going to start building up the Halloween by talking about different creatures each week. So this week, I'd like to talk more about vampires. I have some vampire history here, both in real life and in cinema. And then maybe next week we'll do zombies, or maybe next week we're going to talk a lot about Dr. Gift. Is Dr. Gift a zombie, or what has he got going on? It's more of a ghost thing. Oh. But it's a monster movie, too. Ghosts will be another topic. That'll be a different week. I believe Brother Michelle has a game she wants to play with us here, too. So we'll work her into an upcoming episode as well. So what do you know about vampires? I know that men's sexual fantasies are everything in porn. Women's sexual fantasies, primarily, for some reason, and this is data-backed, they're vampires. Really? So I know that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know the first Dracula movie. Um, I understand. I get the sexual, you know, undertones and all that. Uh, don't know. I got to be honest. I'm not a huge fan because they don't do much different than each other. I feel like this is a pretty worn out trope. But there are some great vampire movies. Not many, but a couple. Yeah, I mean, I think that that sexy vampire seductive trope thing you're talking about really that wasn't the origin of, of vampires. So vampires, the idea of vampires, and, and we'll just define it for everybody who knows what a vampire is, I would imagine, but vampires are mythological creatures that uh, maybe were once alive in some stories. Uh, maybe they're possessed by demons in other stories, but uh, they're, they're the undead, but they also survive by feeding on the life force of the living. Usually that's by biting them in the neck and drawing their blood. Sometimes it's by stealing their plasma or another form of life force in different comic books and movies. And everybody tries to put their little spin on it. But basically, they feast on the living. They're undead. They can't be killed. But at the same time, in most situations and in most stories, they can't go into the sunlight. They truly are travelers of the night, as I mentioned, not women of the night, although sometimes. Um, but <laughs> they really are confined by nighttime because the sunlight will turn them into dust or flame or kill them. So the idea of vampires was popularized in Southeastern and Eastern Europe uh, in the 18th century following a mass hysteria, almost like the Salem witch trials where they were just accusing people of being witches back in 18th century, uh, Eastern and Southeastern Europe. They were just accusing people of being vampires and hanging them, beheading them, staking them through the heart. That was a whole big thing. Now, look, I've proved that I'm not good at math, but do the math there. It's not that long ago it's that not we were that believing this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they probably saw it on TikTok or the 18th century equivalent of TikTok. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Townspeople, and these were simple farming folk. They were not well-educated people. Um, the idea of vampires has folklore that preceded this 18th century mass hysteria event by, you know, thousands of years. But the idea that a vampire was present, it always showed itself the way that all things show themselves. Your cattle's dying. Your cow's not producing milk. Um, there's an illness out there. It's all these unknown things that they don't have scientific reasons for. So, of course, there's a vampire present, right? The thing you're talking about, though, like the modern day charismatic vampire image that began in 1819 with the publication of The Vampire, V-A-M-P-Y-R-E, that was written by John Polidori. That's where the whole idea of this charismatic invite me in and I'm going to seduce you. And next thing you know, he bites the woman and then she becomes Dracula's bride. And then there was that whole trope where he's always trying to have brides and, and seduce women. And then there's the the lover of that individual that comes back to get revenge on the vampire and the whole tragedy that unfolds there. So that is, um, again, that all kind of began in 1819 with this novel, The Vampire. However, what's considered to be the most quintessential vampire novel is 1897's Bram Stoker when he wrote Dracula. Yeah. Because Dracula is, by and large, the most famous of any vampire character ever. What did he add to it that hadn't been there already? See, that's a funny thing. A lot of this 
just became derivative of everything that came before it. So what I'll tell you, I'll tell you what Bram Stoker did. Bram Stoker brought in the story of Vlad the Impaler, who is kind of what Nandor is in what we do in the shadows. He is a uh, ro- uh, an ancient Romanian barbarian, I guess, or, or, or warrior. And he was rumored to have drank the blood of his enemies as a way of intimidation and things like that. However, funny story, I just heard on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the PBS radio news show that I listen to their podcast every week through DNA and scientific evidence suggests that Vlad the Impaler was actually vegan. <laughs> so, so it's crazy. They did like finger swabs and, and I don't know where they got saliva, but they did DNA testing to show that like, yeah, it's showing that he did not eat meat. It's amazing. <laughs> so the whole idea of vampires living in Transylvania and coming from Romania and, and all that Eastern European story that all came about because Bram Stoker really tied Vlad the Impaler and some real history into the story of vampires and the mythology that was all, all a part of that. That I remember coming out when we were in high school or junior high. And I remember all the early emo kids who were listening to Depeche Mode and The Cure had a softback <laughs> copy of uh, Bram Sto- Stoker's Stroker's. Bram Stoker's. That was the porno version. (laughs) (laughs) So Dracula as a character, there's only one other character that's appeared in more films. So he's become public domain. That's why Dracula and Van Helsing and Dracula's familiar, as I mentioned earlier, familiars were the human, you know, gophers, uh, Renfield. These are all public domain characters. So the only character you pause here you. in gotta pause you. So yeah. you're teaching me something I don't know. Renfield is a movie that just came out that I just watched with yeah, Nicolas yeah. Cage. I've never yeah. heard the word Renfield before. So there is a thing called a Renfield. Renfield was a person. He was a, a character that was Dracula's familiar, much like Guillermo is and what we do in the shadows for Nandor. Renfield, and he was in Bram Stoker's 1992. It was um, Francis Ford Coppola's movie. He, he yeah. did Bram Stoker's Dracula that came out in 92. Renfield was a character in there. You may remember him. He was eating rats and living in an insane asylum. I remember he had like a straight jacket that was like tied to the ground. Oh, too long ago. Yeah, I don't remember at all. He also was a character in Bela Lugosi's uh, Dracula movie, the original Universal Studios Dracula. So Renfield is a reoccurring character, but you're right. That Nicolas Cage movie just came out it does focus on his familiar. So it focuses more on the human aspect of it rather than Nicolas Cage's Dracula. The only joke I remember working was when Renfield comes to the center that they're all in and the welcome mat says, come in. So he just walks yes. in. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because that's another part of the, the history of vampires. They can only enter your home if you invite them in, but they could also do hypnosis to convince you to have you invite them in. So that's the whole trope there they can't enter unless they're welcomed into the the home or the building but that is a funny workaround that the welcome mat just (laughs) come as you are yeah that was a good laugh (laughs) so with dracula being public domain the way he is the only character to appear in more movies is sherlock holmes so sherlock holmes is number one dracula is number two appeared in more movies and stories and books and comics and everything else it's just fair game so no shit, Sherlock's number one, Dracula number two. I hear people mention Dracula a hell of a lot more than Sherlock Holmes these days. Yeah. So to talk about vampires in movies and cinema, the very first vampire movie was 1992's Nosferatu, which was a silent film. It's really what brought vampires to the masses. I mean, 1922, movies were the new technology. Silent or not, it was really the first horror movie that I can think of. I can't remember if that was a silent film. Uh, like, I remember it was. seeing it was. Yeah, I remember seeing part of it in film class at college, but I don't think I've ever even gone all the way through that movie. He's an ugly yeah. son of a bitch, isn't he, in that one with those weird ears? Very bat like with yeah. the pointy ears and the really long fingers and the very, you know, laying down in the crypt and just rising up. And it was like probably really great special effects for what they had at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then the very first talking vampire role 
was that Universal Studios Dracula, which starred Bela Lugosi in 1931, with the talking, with the advanced special effects, with everything else, they can just do so much more with the character, get across the eeriness, the charisma, just everything else, the seduction, and we really got into like that whole sexy, seductive vampire, not that baddie-looking freak from Nosferatu. Let me tell you, Bill, nobody was having sex fantasies about that guy. No, yeah, I was just thinking how foul that is. <laughs> if you're into that, you've got a hardcore right, Dracula all fetish. All right, all right, And, of course, the character went on. There were, uh, remember, we talked, I think, on here before about Hammer films. Mm-hmm. The 70s horror films, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Hammer Horror, um, actually from 1958, and it spawned seven sequels. They had Christopher Lee, who I know was Count Dooku from Star Wars Episode One and Two. He played Dracula. He kind of picked up where Bela Lugosi left off and tried to do his own thing with the character. And these, of course, were in color, and it was more modernized and more special effects and everything else, but... Still very much the same characters, still had Renfield, still had Van Helsing. And it's always the battle of Van Helsing, the vampire hunter versus Dracula and the vampire, the undead. Those Hammer films, you know what? We should talk about that. That's a whole universe I've never gone down. Like Christopher mm-hmm. Lee's in a ton of them. You know who else is in them? Um, the guy from Star Wars who played, you're so good with the names, I'm terrible. He, but he was the bad guy. He was Darth Vader's friend. He seemed to be Darth Vader's boss. They recreated him with CGI in Rogue One. He's on the Death Star. He died on the Death Star. British guy. Oh, yeah. You're talking about um, the guy who played Tarkin. Yeah, Tarkin. Thank you. I was going Admiral Akbar in my head. I'm like, no, no I know what Grand it is. Admiral Grand Tarkin. Moff Tarkin. It was played by... Um, well, whoever he is. He's big in Hammer, I think, because I've seen his face associated yeah. every time I've seen Hammer mentioned online. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Movies that happened while I was alive. <laughs> we already mentioned 1992's Bram Stoker's Dracula. That, of course, featured Gary Oldman playing Dracula. Winona Ryder was in there as the one he seduces. Her lover was Keanu Reeves. And in that movie, Van Helsing was played by Anthony Hopkins. I'm sorry, Sir Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, that movie was too mean. It started. It like seemed a little grimy for me. I kind of was staying away from it. I like. I was starting to get to feel like. <laughs> I don't think this is my kind of movie. <laughs> I don't think this is what I like about horror movies. This looks more like a love movie. Love yeah, story. it's not what I was expecting when I watched it. I remember watching it back when it first came out on, on VHS. Like, I didn't go to the movie and see it. Like, I was only 12 when this came out. But I remember it was like, oh, we got a scary movie. And we went home and watched it. And I was like, the fuck was that? That wasn't a scary movie. <laughs> like, Parts of it were like some jump scares where you like turned into a bat and shit like that. But it was more about, you're right, it was a love story. It was more about the history. And it was basically a exactly what the title made it sound like. It was a remake of the novel that Bram Stoker wrote in 1897, put the film. And of course, it was Francis Ford Coppola. So it was really artsy. And, you know, you have real actors and shit like that. But not what I was expecting as a 12 year old watching a vampire movie. Next one I've written down here is Blade with Wesley Snipes. I mentioned him as having that yeah. cameo and what we do in the shadows. There was actually three Blade movies. Uh, 1998 was the first one. 2002 was the second. 2004 was Blade Trinity. This, of course, starred Wesley Snipes, who was a daywalker because he was half vampire, half human. So he was able to go out in the day, and do some hunting in the day. And he was actually a vampire hunter who was half vampire. Also brought in the whole thing with like, I'm using a samurai sword and machine guns. And it was almost like vampires meet the matrix, I think is probably a, a good way to describe yeah. that. That's the tone it had. The matrix look was the look they had. And yeah. Yeah. Dude, every time you would kill somebody, those vampires would turn into those bad blood CGI puddles? Blood, blood bubbles. Yeah. <laughs> they were bubbling puddles. <laughs> oh, they were terrible. Yeah, in addition to Wesley Snipes, we had Chris Christopherson, who played Whistler, who was his hunting partner. Donald Logue is in there, and he actually has a cameo in What We Do in the Shadows. He's, he's a, a character you might recognize from some, from some sitcoms that are out there. Stephen Dorff played the main bad guy, and Tracy Lords was in this as well. Mm-hmm. I remember. <laughs> so she was doing panels 
couple years after this came out, I remember meeting Tracy Lords and thinking, this is weird. <laughs> yeah, you're here for nobody cares for you about Blade. They're, they're here for you for other reasons. Well, the only reason I wrote down Tracy Lords was because I thought, well, Bill probably ran into her at a, at yeah, a con one time. I definitely met her. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, she's not that much into it. You know what's funny? These artists who are at this level, they go for like years, hardcore, and then something happens and they go, I've had enough. I want out. I'm never going back. I wonder <laughs> if she's still doing them. I don't know. Next one on the list here, very much in the same world feel as what Blade was. The Underworld series starring Kate Beckinsale. She played Celine. Underworld really got into vampires versus werewolves. Yeah. The vampire versus lichen thing where, you know, they're mortal enemies. And what we do in the shadows plays with this a little bit. But with Universal Studios owning... The, van, the werewolf, the wolfman, and owning you know, Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, owning all these rights. Over the years, all these monsters shared universes, shared worlds. And Underworld really got into this whole idea of vampires and werewolves being bitter enemies and having this ancient feud going on. And you know that they made five of these fucking things? Yeah, I was going to say, I remember the first one being sleek and really cool. And I also remember thinking, you're really into this black suit, Matrix style. Because again, this yep. one had that too. And yep. uh, what's her name? She she was so cool in that movie. Kate Beckinsale? Yeah, what's her name? Kate Beckinsale. Yeah, like she's just yeah. badass in that flick. But yeah. I don't know why they thought they could keep on cranking these things out. And it just went to dog shit. That's a shame. Well, the first one came out in 2003, then 2006, then 2009, then 2012, and then one came out in 2016. When I clicked on that one to do some research, I was like, well, this is probably a reboot. Kate Kim, oh, nope, there she is, top billing. She's mm, still in yeah. that one, too. So she wrote it all the way through to the end, five different movies. You mentioned real quick, and I'm, I hope I don't throw off your, your, your stuff here, but Van Helsing, no. I think, came out before this. 2004. And that I remember thinking, oh. Uh, and that was before Underworld? No, 2003 was Underworld. 2004 was the next year. Van Helsing starring Hugh Jackman playing the titular character. Kate Beckinsale was also in this as his partner. Also starring too much CGI because this movie fucking blew. That's where I was just about to go because I had that same <laughs> feeling with the uh, Underworld. I was like, yeah. okay, now we're just getting messy. I think the, these two movies, this period is when I started to go, I think we're pressing a little too hard on the special effects. Yeah. I all, like, I actually remember thinking that with this, with these two uh, franchises. Yeah. Van Helsing had Frankenstein's monster who, so first of all, there's Dracula and Dracula is trying to breed a whole army of offspring. He has three brides, but because he's dead, death can't create life. But then there is Frankenstein's monster who is death that became life. So he was the secret formula that needed to be put into this whole machine. So Van Helsing's trying to track down Frankenstein's monster and Dracula's trying to track down Frankenstein's monster. And Frankenstein's monster is this huge steampunk style, too much CGI abomination. That's just so fucking bad. Also starring, uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde was in there. There was other monsters that were also in this world. And it was just, I don't know. I, I watched it probably three or four times since then. And it hasn't gotten any better for me. I remember some flying screaming dot monsters, female yes. demons or something. Yeah. Yeah. They were the brides and they were poorly done. Then they laid eggs and the eggs were supposed to like hatch after Frankenstein's monster was struck by lightning while laying on this table. And it was going to go through him into these hatchlings and the hatchlings were like little like bat, F bat baby things and they were so poorly done CGI and I guess at the time it was probably the best that they can do but so it really didn't age well at all and this is really one of those movies where the CGI at the time is what was selling it because the story sure as fuck wasn't getting the job done so now you have a poor story and you have poorly aged CGI and in present day and you got dog shit see this is one of the reasons I understand why the Writers Guild of, of America Association is afraid of AI I'm pretty sure AI could have written something better than three <laughs> brides laying eggs to pass the energy back into the Dracula. That's ridiculous. And honestly, 
it was derivative of stories that have come out before it about Dracula and about vampires. Again, this was nothing new. This is all rehashing. <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other things of note on here, and this is in no particular order. True Blood came out on HBO from 2008 to 2014. I watched True Blood. True Blood was a lot of vampires fucking. And it also brought in fairies and werewolves and all other kinds of mythical creatures that existed. But the difference about True Blood was in this story, it took place in Louisiana and people knew that vampires were real. Vampires, quote, came out of the coffin and their blood was actually being sold as a drug on the street. And it would give humans like super healing, super speed. Um, I remember the one guy was like a football player and he was taking it to basically like juice. It was like a performance enhancing drug, but he just had like a little vial of vampire blood. And it was <laughs> uh, it was all based on the, the Sookie Stackhouse novels or the Southern Vampire series of books written by Charlene Harris. And this is one where I think there was like six seasons and dude, I limped to the end. I was like, it was one of those things where like, I didn't even want to watch it anymore, but it was like, well, I've done it this far. I guess I just watched everybody knew it was like, this is the final season. It was just like, Oh, can it just be over already? It was almost like what game of Thrones became. If we knew the last season was going to be so fucking bad. Amy wanted me to watch it. I was into the first season, but at some point I could tell the, the plot had changed. This show wasn't made for me. Look, <laughs> sex scenes, I don't get it. I'm not 14 anymore. I don't need them, right? I don't need Red Shoe Diaries in my vampire stuff. I just want a good story. So that would annoy me. And then it just started to get dumb, dumb. I, at one point, all of a sudden, the uh, the tall white guy turns into a panther. And I'm like, why is he a <laughs> panther now? And that's I was just like, I can't do this, Amy. I'm so sorry. This is just too dumb. And I would hear you guys talk about it. I'm just like, nope, not getting back on board. Not for me. Too dumb. Well, they did do uh, something interesting there. And this is, I kind of alluded to it in what we do in the shadows. In True Blood, they did have like a vampire government. Like There was like a governor of each area. So there was like a hierarchy of power as far as the vampire world went. And they kind of brought that, they, they play with that a little bit in what we do with the shadows where there's like the Baron and then there's like like I said, the Vampire Council and shit like that. So it was it was pretty funny. And then lastly, in movies here, I wrote down, you know, we mentioned Ren, Renfield already uh, with Nicolas Cage. That's the newest one I can think of. But Twilight uh, and those movies, they came out in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, and 2012. These didn't do anything for me. This was the whole thing with Robert Pattinson and... Kristen Stewart and Taylor Lautner was in there. And there was also vampires versus werewolves again. But it really wasn't about, you know, they're going to fight. It was like, who's going to bang this girl who's human? Yeah, that's, that's That was the whole battle. I, I don't know. Does Jen, does Jenna want to come on the air real quick? You want to come on the air? You want to share your two cents here? Ask her why girls like vampire movies. Why, why do girls like vampire movies? I'm not taking no for an answer. Oh, she thinks it's sexy. Yeah. Like, what is sexy about somebody trying to steal your identity and take over your life? I don't get the sex appeal part. I really don't. And I just can't follow along with that storyline. It's silly. I don't know, man. I don't know. Other things that were... Um, I, I can't believe I forgot this one, but I wrote down the novels here of Anne Rice uh, with the, the Vampire Diaries. Um what was the one with Christian Slater and Antonio Banderas and um, Tom Cruise? Interview with a Vampire. That oh, was based right. on a. That was that was a big one. That was based Lost on Boys. You better Lost name Boys. Lost Boys, or we're going to get written to. <laughs> Lost Boys written down here, of course. Um, so there's there. I mean, there's all, all kinds of vampire movies, but again, they all are kind of derivative of the same thing. The funny thing about the Lost Boys, though, it was like the leather jacket wearing eighties greaser vampires. <laughs> <laughs> the two Corys fight vampires. It's eighties schlock for the ages. Yeah. Anything else you want to throw in here about vampires or anything I missed that you feel that was a horrible omission? No, I think you taught me some and hell I went my whole life not knowing about Renfield. 
All right, man. Let's do some news then. All right. Let's cover some news. Hey, how about this? Have you heard? Coming from the Hollywood Reporter, the WGAW president addresses distinction in criticism of Bill Mayer resuming production during strike. There's definitely some anger. So have you heard about what's going on here? A couple of people going back to work. So I heard about people saying, like, let's go ruin Bill Maher's day. So I knew he said something, but I don't know the specifics around what he said and why people were angry. And all comments online had something to do with, like, fuck Bill Maher. Let's show him kind of thing. All right. Well, let me break it down because this is exactly what I learned summarizing this story. Meredith Stein, or Steam, the president of WGAW, commented on the criticism of talk show hosts, including Bill Maher, resuming their shows amid ongoing Writers Guild strikes. The distinction, according to Stein, is that Mayor Maher is a Writers Guild member, making his return to work problematic for many who view it as scabbing. This hmm. is different from other hosts like Drew Barrymore, who might be a SAG member and might have waivers to proceed with their show. Stein emphasized that while some hosts wish to bring back their lower paid crew to work, there are others who personally pay to keep their shows running during the strike. Bill Maher recently announced that his show Real Time will return without writers. While he expressed sympathy for the writers' concerns, he also highlighted the struggles of other crew members. Mayer promised not to include scripted segments like monologues or new rules, which is a segment that he does on his show, out of respect for the strike. But this is what he wrote. So he wrote, it has been five months and it's time to bring people back to work. The writers have important issues that I sympathize with and hope they are addressed to their satisfaction. But they are not the only people with issues, problems and concerns. I'm not prepared to lose an entire year and see many below the line people suffer so much. Didn't I tell you this was going to start happening? It's cracking. It's cracking. Several WGA covered shows, including those of Mar, Barrymore, and Jennifer Hudson, have planned to resume production despite the strike, which began on May 2nd. Some of these shows have faced picketing. In response to Mayor's decision, the WGA expressed disappointment, emphasizing that Mayor, as a WGA member, should adhere to strike rules and not perform any writing services. Mm. How do you feel about this? Uh, uh, look... I, I'm still in the middle, but this is, this is going to happen. I knew this would happen because look, you're going to, this is what always happens in a union that gets too aggressive. People need to eat. People need to, you know, they start to break the union. Why would it happen here? But he's returning to work without writers. So is he returning to work to better himself or is he returning to work to better his camera people and his, stage directors and his craft service like what's his who's he benefiting besides himself is my question yeah i don't know i mean he owns uh ben affleck's old house it's not cheap what's he doing making so much money he, the guy's got to work yeah but here's the thing this guy does work doing stand-up and he actually uses real time as a way just to promote where he's going to be the next week or the next two weeks he's he's working in doing other jobs other than real time with bill maher he doesn't have no. if this is just about feeding himself and paying his fucking mortgage he doesn't have to break picket or scab in order to do that because he's making living other ways. Uh, that's a really fair point. Well, look, I'm not somebody to tell somebody who what they should think. So if he, if he, if it's all for him, hey, okay, you you think what you think, but you signed, you know, joined up with this union. You signed up with this union. They have these rules. You now suddenly don't agree. You break. You break the power of the team that you're supposed to be supporting. But I get yeah. why you would break. I but just here's do. the thing. Now, now he breaks and now people will, you know, I believe, likely not tune in and watch it. And then he'll be the one that'll be like, oh, it's all this woke bullshit. Well, it's not woke bullshit. It's people sticking to their fucking morals and their beliefs. And you're just kind of selling out is what it sounds like to me. He may be selling out, but that's showbiz. Absolutely. That's my interpretation of this. I'm not going to watch him. Yeah, I still can't find the, the password to my Max account, so I'm not going to watch him because of that. But even if I could watch him, I wouldn't watch him. I'd be surprised if it impacts him that much at all. I just don't think people care. I don't think people in the Midwest give a damn about no. what's going on in elite Hollywood. I don't either. I, I just don't care. I think they'll tune right in. And I think he knows it. And he's like, look, I, uh, I'm i not all in on this thing. I'm going to be the dickhead. Yeah, I think he chose to be the dickhead. I don't think those people that don't care are his viewers. Well, he's moved awfully uh, right, you know. He oh, I don't. was a liberal. Now he's sort of standing in the middle with me. So I don't know who anybody's viewers are anymore. Oh, after mm -hmm. watching that Republican debate, I mean, I just saw, well, 
two people didn't make any sort of a impact at all, but the other five or six are just as different as different could be. I mean, it's just like, man, man, oh man. Uh, all right, let me read you another item. This is from Yahoo. I love reading Yahoo News. Yeah, it's so funny to me that Yahoo still has a fucking news thing. I think it's just a stream and they just like republish other articles from other places. Like they don't have their own journalists, right? <laughs> no, probably not. Okay. Blue faces on off girlfriend Jaden Alexis slams him for reuniting with Chrissy and Rock. Calls him a narcissist. What oh, do you I think don't of that stuff? understand <laughs> any of the words you just said. What is that? Oh, this is just more proof that we are completely out of touch. I saw this headline. I was like, blue faces. Who? On off girlfriend Jaden Lexus. Who? Slams him for reuniting with Chrissy and Rock. Who? 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 Like there's three people I've never heard of. And this is a top entertainment story from In Touch. Yahoo is republishing In Touch. The first thing I thought when you said blue face was like, is this is like a CGI like filming maneuver? And then I was like, is this like a black face kind of thing? Like, <laughs> what is going on here? I still, what does it mean? These are people. I don't know. These are people. I was just reading the headline just to make you laugh. I'm not going to even <laughs> go into the article. Good, please. I'm not I, go into the article. I don't want to feign interest. <laughs> well, here's an Ahsoka uh, thing I wanted to bring up, and I want to know your opinion on this. It, it's even if you're not a Star Wars fan, you're a fan of this kind of stuff. We are always talking about what's too much fan service. So Star Wars admits its Mandalorian character in Ahsoka's show is pure fan service. Captain Carson Tiva on The Mandalorian has joined the cast of Ahsoka, and Star Wars has confessed this is just to be fan service. Like they're saying, this is just fan service. Like it's a good thing. Almost tells you that they don't quite get that it's not we celebrate fan service. We <laughs> don't love fan service. We love Easter eggs. Th that's what we love. Who runs around saying, I love, give me more fan service. Everybody complains about too much fan service. And these guys go out and say, oh, yeah, we just added some fan service. So the funny thing about it is Carson Tika is played by, uh, I don't know his, his the actor's name. He's a, an Asian gentleman. An older guy, he's a lifelong Star Wars fan. It's probably his dream come true to play this character or just be part of the Star Wars world. And he was the guy that was flying around the X-Wing in The Mandalorian. And he was one, it was like him and Dave Filoni and Deborah Chow were, was the other, the third pilot in The Mandalorian. But in this one here, he, again, he's still like, almost like a space police officer. He's out there on patrol, just flying around with his X-Wing and He's doing kind of the exact same thing here in Ahsoka. I don't think that people, people are probably like, yeah, good for you. But it's not drawing. Like people aren't flocking to watch Ahsoka because of Cars Antica. Yeah, when he popped up, I went, oh, it's that guy. <laughs> that was it. Like I wasn't excited. Yeah, that's what I did. I was like, oh, hey, he's back. That's pretty cool. Who cares? All right, let's hit you with one more news story and then we'll... Shut this bastard down. And of course, it's a strike story because that's all there is out there. SAG after President Fran Drescher. Oh, it's fun to watch Fran Drescher Fran, throw yeah. a temper tantrum. It is. It's crazy. It's like, that's the nanny and she's pissed. <laughs> Fran Drescher urges members to approve strike authorization against video game companies. That's right. They're coming after your video games, but they're not coming after your video games necessarily. They want the option to. That's really what they're saying. And I see a lot of people have are losing their mind because they don't really understand what it is. Fran Drescher, the president of the SAG-AFTRA, is rallying her peeps to give the thumbs up for a strike against video game companies. While the Guild has been on strike against film and TV since July 14th, a strike against video game companies could kick off any time post-September 25th, once the strike authorization vote wraps up. This wouldn't be the Guild's first rodeo with the gaming peeps. They had a 183 strike back in 2016-2017. But now, Fran... Wants people to understand just because they vote a strike authorization doesn't mean a strike's definitely going to go down. It just gives the board the green light to call one if they feel it's needed. The Guild has been trying to hash things out with video game companies for about a year now. Even after plenty of bargaining session, these gaming big shots ain't meeting the needs of the sag after members in some crucial areas. Two of the biggest causes of tension... Wages and the use of artificial intelligence. sag after uh -huh. wants a pay bump, 11% in year one and 4% in years two and three. They're also stressing about how AI could affect their members, especially in gaming. 
On the flip side, the video game companies are like, hey, we want a solid contract too, and we're trying our best here. So if SAG go or if uh, if Fran goes after them, she's going to open up a, a whole new can of worms. It's going to be crazy. And who knows? She may. Maybe. I mean, you, I don't. I don't really know what the conversations are back there. You know, to to say she she's leaning towards it or against it. But if she leans into this, that's really going to have an impact. You got to figure these video games aren't just like pixelized bits anymore. These are like real actors and motion yeah. capture, and this is like real deal cinematography being used yeah. in these video games. You know, we're not playing Dig Dug or Pac Man or Ms. Pac Man here anymore. It's like real deal. So if they're using actors. I always figured the actors in video games were like either people that were washed up or people that weren't good enough to be in actual, you know, guilds or unions or any of that bullshit. I just figured video game actors was like a whole other class. It's like actors, video game actors, porn. I thought that was the hierarchy of it. It sounds like there's a lot more stuck in there. Like video game uh, designers want a union. CGI artists want a union. You yeah, know, everybody's seen this and they, yeah, and they want to pick up their own union. I Look, I don't know enough about unions. I know there's times I think they're great and there's times I think they're probably a little too overzealous. And this one, I don't have any uh, nearly enough information to make that call. But, you know, too many unions may not get along well. We might be, it might be like continents fighting each other over, you know, world control. And that's not going to make the economy run better in Hollywood. That's not going to make the, the movies come out. It's going to really kill a lot of Hollywood. So that's my biggest fear with this entire strike. So it's so easy to look at somebody from a headline. And by the way, again, I'm in the middle. I swear to God, I'm in the middle. I know you're on the actor side. I see a lot of the actors with their picket signs, like, you know, feel bad for us and stuff like that. So they do do marketing that other people are going to take. Look at those rich assholes. They got everything and now they're asking for money. So it's like, or more money. It's like, you can't please everybody. So sometimes I look at this picketing and I go, I don't even know if this is a good idea anymore. I don't know what's a good idea. All I know is whatever is happening, it's not moving forward. Change something. They're using well-known actors and people that are well-off and, and are established in Hollywood. They bring notoriety and bring attention and bring media to the strikes. But the strikes are really to support people that aren't making, they're not living that high on the hog, you know? Like, they're not that well-established. This impacts lesser-known actors who, if you saw striking on the side of the road, you really wouldn't give two shits about. They're using those famous faces to, to draw in the eyeballs and, and bring attention to the cause. It's not yeah. that Brian Kranz necessarily is crying that he's not getting paid enough money. That's true. The big actors usually talk about it more holistically. Yes. I mean, they have to. They're not, they look terrible. They said, well, I need more money. Yeah. But, yeah, it does You're look like... Touch. So <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Of course, they're trying to paint the picture that it's look at these spoiled babies and yada, yada, yada. But I mean, there's character actors out there that, you know, they're, they're working, they're living roll the role. You know, like it's not like they're well established or, you know, they're just trying to make it. And that's who the strike is, is really trying to benefit. It's really about those extras who are concerned about coming in, getting paid one day, getting scanned, sent home. And now they're scanned into the system and used for the rest of the season. That's not the way it should be. That's what the strike's about. One of my employees at work said, I really don't understand it. I mean, wh what can AI do? And I told her the story about uh, how James Earl Jones gave the right to use his voice so that when you hear Darth Vader going forward, it's going to be his tonality that was recorded, but it's going to be words typed into a computer. You know, what if you were an actor, you go in, you you get paid 500000 for a role, and then the movie blows up, becomes a 10-movie deal, and they don't bring it back because they've already sampled you and they've CGI'd you. He went, oh. We got what we need from you, asshole. <laughs> and that's really the fear. And yeah. Yeah. Where we'll be revealed slowly as the strike moves forward. Until then, listen to us. Yeah, we'll be here every week, provided I come back from Dallas. <laughs> yeah, man. Safe travels. I'm looking forward to some stories. Maybe we'll talk about some zombies or some ghosts or some other spooky bullshit as we get closer to Halloween. Maybe we'll talk to Brother Michelle and hear her her game. That could be scary, too. We'll hear what's going on moving forward. Yeah. And apologies if you're one of the early listeners to this show on Monday morning and it hasn't come out at 6 a.m. You can tell that I got delayed on my flight coming home just by when this, this episode we're recording now comes out. 
Yeah, that'll be funny. It's like, you, you, Bill, it didn't come out at six. And I'll be like, I'm still in damn Dallas. I can't get a flight. <laughs> ah! If this drops and you get your notification for a 6 a.m. episode Monday morning, you know everything is right with the world. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Root for me. Thanks for listening. Tickle, tickle, tickle. I may have gone too far in a few places. <laughs>